Uh, yeah, if everyone's ready, just a brief off time roadmap. We're running a critique, but resolutionally. So that's a blast. Uh, okay. Hi, so sorry. I need one moment. Um, okay. My headset just died after a long weekend. I'm going to go grab my backup. All right. Testing, testing. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I can hear you. Great. Helps to have two headsets. Yeah. Okay. Then it's just one off. Everyone's ready. My time begins now. Thesis, racial, ra racism and capitalism are inseparable. The U.S. built its ruling capitalist class to the genocide and theft of land stolen from the indigenous inhabitants of this con continent and by exploiting the enslaved labor of African people. This country was founded on the class war of rich upon the basis of racism conducted, enabled, and safeguarded by the state apparatus. The U.S. created white supremacy to uphold this class war, constructing an empire of capitalist domination through westward expansion and colonization in the 1800s and the U.S. imperialist subjugation of black and brown peoples across the global south in the 20th and 21st century. So the framework, the rule of the ballot is to vote for the with the best anti-colonial socialist method of eradicating racial capitalism. The second framework point here is that materialism comes first. The ASA point is that materialism so supersedes idealism. Idealism is formed through materialism, which means that materialism always comes first and what actually impacts history. Ideas are always formed based on material impacts. Economic theories like Marxism are ideas that are based on the physical implications and harms of capitalism. The BSA point here is that material impacts and material change have to be prioritized in the debate space. This means that materialism is what the materialism comes before fairness education. So those are both ide ideological theories. What is considered fair cannot be determined by the material lens of class and resource differences. The impacts of racial capitalism. First, we have the commod commodification of people of color. The process of racial capitalism relies upon and reinforces commodification of racial identity, thereby degrading that identity by reducing it to another thing to be bought and sold. The US perpetuates anti-blackness through total abandonment of black communities or through outright terrorism and murder. This commodification and violence tanks quality of life and is infinitely probable because it already exists. The second impact here is ecological destruction. Racial capitalism is a higher system of class and value works through settler colonialism to devalue, exploit, and commodify other than human life in the interests of capitalism. The B supplement here is that colonial ideologies that view land as capital leads to the erasure of positive environmental ideologies driven by the oppression of indigenous communities. This prevents them from performing environmentally friendly practices. Look, this leads to biodiversity loss, which is an extinction level impact. The C supplement here is that the usage of things through utility framing causes ecocide. Now our advocacy. The US federal government should not use its power over the dollar payment system to sanction other countries, the solvency. Our first point is that of economic accumulation. The US strategically uses sanctions to maintain its status as an economic hegemon, which it uses to further racial capitalism. Economic accumulation directly links into racial capitalism because it's the ideolo ideology that gives motive to place profit above all else. Accumulating wealth leads to individuals prioritizing profit more and more. Look at the fact that in response to Iran threatening the US's economic he hegemonic status, the US prevented any companies from dealing in Iran, which, will, which absolutely- Yo, I I mean, sectors entirely, let me finish this point, entirely unrelated to the development of nuclear weapons. Yes. Could we get the role of the ballot text? Uh, yeah, Neha, can you send that to the chat? Awesome. I'll just reiterate the sentence that I left off on. Look at the fact that in response to Iran threatening the U.S.'s hegemonic status, the U.S. prevented any companies from dealing in Iran, which absolutely crippled their economy in sectors entirely unrelated to the development of nuclear weapons, which indicates they're clearly using this to further their own economic goals. The second solvency point here is that of liberal internationalism. Liberal internationalism is a foreign policy doctrine that argues that liberal states should intervene in other sovereign states in order to pursue liberal objectives. Such intervention can include both military invasion or humanitarian aid. This is exactly what sanctions are used for. Often the excuse for sanctions, the country in question has committed human rights abuses, despite the fact that sanctions often do little other than harm the impoverished and marginalized in a different country. Liberal internationalism is a direct link into racial capitalism. Liberal internationalism emerged as an exclusive order reserved only for Western states that could be stabilized and protected from non-Western states who were considered to be illiberal. Liberal internationalism produced a highly unequal order characterized by imperial relations of dominance and dependence that justified deep interventions into the domestic affairs of others. Aside from this inevitable link towards imperialism, the ideology itself is rooted in racial capitalism places a divide between countries. Removing the dollar power sanction, sanction route directly decreases liberal internationalism because the U.S. no longer has the means to essentially like push their agendas in these other countries with the exclusive liberalism. The third solvency point here is that of hegemonic internationalism. Hegemonic internationalism is defined as one nation pursuing its own interests at the expense of another nation. Hegemonic inter internationalism is a direct link to racial capitalism as it is the ideology that justifies settler colonialism. The AFS plan removes its hegemonic internationalism because it stops the settler power being used to gain capital from other 
other nations. Ultimately, we stop the U.S. being able to exploit these other nations and harm these other nations through like their hegemony over the dollar and these sanctions. So we stop its hegemonic internationalism. The fourth link here is that of settler, or sorry, the fourth solvency point here is that of settler futurity. The U.S. has continued power over the dollar payment system, seeks to recuperate and not interrupt settler colonialism to reform the settlement. The only way to stop the continued existence of settler colonialism is for the U.S. to disrupt its power of exerting its power, to dis disrupt its practice of exerting its power over other countries. The B supplement here is that settler flow futurity directly links into the K because it ensures these settler bodies continue to exist in the future by legitimizing it. Our plan takes action. Yo, I I will take it at the end of this. Our plan takes action that is the direct internal link to removing the U.S. as an economic and global hegemon and thus prevents the continued existence of settler colonialism as practiced by the U.S. Yes, I'll take your question. What does the real world look like after the advocacy? The advocacy, so we're, this is essentially a plan. So we don't have, we're, we don't have any post-fiat impacts. These are all pre-fiat. So we're telling you that we will no longer see um, the existence of a real, at least like gut racial capitalism because the U.S. no longer has a mechanism to exploit these other countries. The impacts of racial capitalism as articulated earlier are the commodification of people of color and ecological destruction. So ultimately we stop both those things from happening by again, removing the U.S.'s mechanism for like continuing, continuing their settler colonialism, which is the mechanism through which they perpetuate racial capitalism. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. With that, I end my time now. Vote F. All right. Um, order is going to be. Hmm, trying to figure out what the best order for this is. All right, yeah, order is going to be a one off and then responding to the AF in order and then um, one or two more off if I have time. We'll see. And the first off isn't super long, probably won't need more than one sheet. Will I need more than one sheet for any of the off? Uh, likely not. Okay, thank you. All right. Oh, also, Timothy, can you write me a counter roll the ballot? Sure. All right. Anyone not ready? All right. Starting my time. I work. Let me just find it. All right. Starting my time. Now, first is the theory. A is the interpretation. The affirmative must defend in the 1AC the implementation and post fiat implications of a topical plan text using the actor in the resolution. Again, the affirmative must defend in the 1AC the implication, implementation and post fiat implications of a topical plan text using the actor in the resolution. Violation. They say it's a plan text, but it's really not because they don't like specify it's, it's like it's just a resolution. They don't actually tell you what specific action the US is going to take to change from what it's doing in the future. In addition, like it, when asked in a POI, they specifically say that they're not defending the post fiat implications, meaning like they're not linking into that part of the interp. Uh, first of the standards, first of all, is understanding the state apparatus. Uh, the state is never a prime mover in politics. Oppressive forces use it to like enforce their programs. But activists can use specific policies to expose how those forces structure society and specifically like the like actual like post fiat implications of those policies and like what material changes what material changes those policy have. So this is the internal link to real world organizing to end oppression and like saying that the government like should take an action doesn't mean you endorse past detrimental actions. Like you can talk about the US like taking positive action without endorsing like the colonial framework that the US has been built upon. Uh, second is yeah, so second is that seeding institutional politics promotes inaction. Debate is a unique opportunity to focus discussion on specific policies in a way that can inform future advocacy. So like the language of policy and science, or I'm not going to read that. Um, I, I, and then, yeah, I'm not going to read that. Um, yeah, moving on to praxis, like theory that praxis is useless. It's like talking about the harm to federal colonialism without like giving specific policy, but also like what that policy is going to do to change the world is useless, meaning we have to understand like how our ideologies can be implemented. Again, like considering fiat is, a, is the best way to actually consider like material impacts. You can actually probably extend anything they read about like materialism as to why we should be like considering the like act, the, the post fiat impacts, post fiat material impacts of the plan. Um, yeah, uh, third is predictability. Uh, Penn State research and pedagogical scholarship so that students who have presented a syllabus on what the expectations and procedures were at the beginning of the semester perform better. This means predictability is really key. This is not predictable as so we expect like affirmative teams to read like not just a plan, but a plan like with the 
and with the post fiat implications because that's what like 99% of debate rounds look like. As an educational activity, when we enter each round, particular expectations of what the topic is, all of us perform better, and that's the internal link to education, as we tell you from the Penn State study. Um, on to the voters. First of all, procedural uh, procedural fairness. Procedural fairness has five implications. The first is jurisdiction. It's impossible to outweigh fairness because anything established in a skewed delivery to space hasn't been rigor rigorously tested. So you can just like all just vote neg on presumption because there's no way to evaluate the truth of the one I see without substantive engagement. Uh, but second of all, is game design like any framework shifts from the primary commitment of debate as its own ends, i.e., to like consider the like post fiat impacts of a specific plan. Must exp um, must explain why we switch sides. Or I'm actually never, never mind. I'm not going to read that. No, no, not game design. Second is uh, dialogue. So even if they're arguing seen through, it's only because they already have an advantage, A, because of the lots of like predictability that gets effective dialogue. And so their app kills like the pedagogical value of debate, which is clash and rigorous armament testing, in terms of their whole methodology of using debate as a form for change. Again, there's proven abuses. We have like two DA specifically about like the post fiat uh, about, about the post fiat implications of the plan that we now can't weigh, like can't weigh against them because they're specifically like not engaging in like the fiat layer. Um, third is access, absent a procedurally fair game, people will lose interest in joining debate in the first place. This means less people are like exposed to like the ideas of debate and specifically even exposed to the ideas that the affirmative prevents, which means it'll turn their solvency in the long term. Lastly, the procedural fairness outweighs structural fairness because it's a question of whether there's an inherent like AFNEG imbalance balance uh, in this. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's inherent there's an inherent like AFNEG imbalance in the structure of debate other than like unequal access to debate because of different subject positions. Like that's the only way we're going to avoid turning debate into like uh, no, I'm actually not going to read that. Sorry. Um, yeah, the second voter is out of idea testing. This is three implications. The first is content mastery. Debaters learn best from strate like strategic iterations of argument production, presentation, and review, and like repeatedly engaging in like policies and considering the impacts allows us to go deeper each time and consistent and balanced debates. And it you know, allows us to like adapt arguments based on feedback from judges and go deeper in each subsequent round. Um, yeah, the second is going to be. Um, the second thing can be the logic of privilege, like choosing like utopian affirmatives where they imagine a world where, like settler colonialism doesn't exist, allows you to only defend what makes comfortable and refuse to take a risk, and also leads to like ignoring the imperial arms that like sanctions are trying to solve for in the status quo. I'll get more to that when I actually enjoy the case, but essentially, you know, this like prevents us from engaging in important issues like the actual like things that sanctions are meant to solve for, and like. Uh, let's pre like privileged people read K like read these apps in bad faith adopt like actual discussion of material suffering that's happening. Uh, so the underview on theory, first of all, you should um yeah, first of all, you should bracket off debate from the political. Debate doesn't seem like a political space, but in reality, the most important thing that happens here, like a formation of our subjectivities, or in simple terms, is like us deciding what our opinions are. There's a space to learn practices that can be a, a space to learn practices that can be applied to the political, but not directly a space for politics or to do politics. Second is that theory is a floor on a ceiling. We just require to prove that like topical fiatic action is good. How you do it is up to you. Um, like we don't require endorsement of the state, just saying that like there's positive action that the state could take. Uh, third. Uh, yeah, third is that they don't get to cross apply arguments from case. It's a question of whether or not we're able to engage these arguments in the first place, meaning if you can't test the argument, you can't test the cross application. Fourth, the competing interpretations like reasonability is arbitrary, at least judge intervention, which means that like whoever has implicit bias will always win, which again like turns uh, uh, turns fairness. Competing interpretations is the only stable way to actually evaluate whether or not this argument should be allowed. Lastly, is that a priori like you have to set the rules of the game before you can play it. We have to like evaluate what arguments can and can't be tested before we actually test those arguments. That means they don't get to weigh the affirmative. On to the case. Uh, yeah, first of all, the same materialism come first, but like at the point where they specifically don't read any advantages, they like term materialism because they don't actually like give you unique to some material impacts and how we could try to solve for them through the affirmative case or through like not solving for the affirmative case. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's only in the unions. Uh, like on the impacts, uh, they talk about like racial capitalism and like the commodification of people in color, but sure, but that's like completely non-unique sanctions. Even in a world where there was absolutely no sanctions, racial, racial capitalism would still be absolutely rampant, especially because they're only advocating for the US and where like a lot of other Western countries, i.e. like most of the EU does sanctions on a regular basis too. Like their like advocacy literally has no solvency for actual racial capitalism. Um, I guess I'm yeah, moving on to the solvency again. Like they have no, uh, they have no solvency for the economic hegemon. Like sanctions are still going to happen, and even if sanctions still happen, racial capitalism will still exist. Um, they say like we uh, like uh, use this to like we like justify uh, justify this with human rights abuses, despite just like harming the impoverished people. We say well, it's true of something that's specifically not true of financial sanctions. Financial sanctions are uniquely effective for actually solving for human rights abuses. Um, they solved for apartheid in 1986. Um, I'm trying to find the other warrants. 
And uh, US financial sanctions have been like uniquely effective because like studies that have found low success rates conflate financial sanctions with economic sanctions and like specific like use of the dollar, i.e. financial sanctions are uniquely effective according to uh, Smith from NPR. Uh, yeah, next I talk about like hegemonic internationalism and it justifies like settler colonialism. But again, like if the EU just becomes a hegemon and becomes like the main sanctioning entity instead, there's no actual change in racial capitalism because like a lot of Europe was also founded on like the same principles of settler colonialism. Um, yeah, and so they say the only way to stop settled colonialism is for like the US to stop doing this, but it literally doesn't solve our settled colonialism at all and ignores other material harms that the US is using like sanctions to solve for the status quo, for example, like the genocide in Myanmar and uh, like terrorism in Iran. Um, last is a new off, uh, which is I have the power to create infinite people and make them really, really happy. I also have the power to stop the heat death of the universe. So I can keep doing that forever. If you vote for me, I'll be really happy and in celebration, I'll do this forever, creating infinite happiness for all these people. So for all these reasons, vote next. Okay, so the order is going to be, Kathy, do you think one new off? Kathy. Okay, well, never mind. I don't think, did you have a counter roll the ballot? I don't know if I just missed it or. I did not get one. Okay, yeah, because I do remember like earlier they said there was one. Okay, it's fine. Um, the order is going to be the K and then the one, the first off that was presented and then the the third off. Was that like the Pascal's like happiness thing? Is that what it was? I don't know if it, it's not a shell or anything, but was that yes, what it was? Yes, that's what it was. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, one second. Is there a text for that or anything, or is it just? It's an argument. It's an argument. Okay, that's all. Okay. Cool. All righty. Everyone's ready. My time starts now. Let's start on the framework la layer. First, extend a rolled about. They don't present a counter rolled about, which means that you have to be evaluating this debate, whether who has the best anti colonial method of eradicating. Um, racial capitalism, the, uh, because they don't have an, another method or don't present that, that means that we probably auto win. Um, also extend the fact that we see that material is, materialism comes before ideas and because fairness in education are ideas, that means that it literally doesn't matter when it comes to materialism because they don't respond to any of our materialist claims within our framework. That means that we have already won this debate because the only off they have is a theory. And because we agree that fairness in education doesn't matter under a materialist lens, that means that we have probably already run this debate and don't let them come up and like answer this framework um again because then we get golden turns um their first response here is that we don't read any advantages we literally do we have impacts we have like links kind of um we just don't have uniqueness uh like we like literally our impacts are about like racism and like uh you know, the environment and people have different structures. You just because we don't have like uniqueness links and impacts does not mean it's not a valid argument. Like literally people use like contentions and stuff and you can't like penalize them for not having that exact structure. And then they like talk about how like um, like our impacts are non-unique to sanctions. The US is the most prominent settler colonialist actor. Removing the mechanism by which they exert power over other countries is uh, absolutely solvent. We are also constrained to the rent. We can't, uh, the res, we can't solve for all. We can't like um, fiat this for both the UN and like all the other actors that they uh, they claim that we have to because we are constrained to the resolution because we are topical and also the u.s can set a precedent and it's more it's actually more about how it makes the people more conscious because if we actually are showing what the u.s is doing badly and um what needs to be done to fix it that'll make people more conscious and actually lead to revolutionary change and then they basically like talk about how like sanctions have uh, like helped people whether they are good or bad is like it does not matter it literally just 
the, the fact that sanctions are liberal in nature is what links into racial capitalism. The fact that even though these nations supposedly need our help, the fact that the US thinks it's their burden to help them links into racial capitalism. Also, like sanctions have generally been bad. Look to the fact that in Iran right now, like people can't get vaccinations specifically because of US sanctions. They ultimately do more harm than good. The warning here is that was that the US uses this as an excuse to implement sanctions completely unrelated to the human rights issues at hand. Yes, sometimes it's because of human rights issues, but most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's for economic accumulation and it's for in order to gain more hegemonic power. And also, if the U.S. is no longer able to maintain this hegemonic hegemony, this harms the EU as well because of the strong trade relations between the two. We already said how the U.S. impacts all these other like settler bodies and how creating this action is actually going to create a ripple change and actually change this. Um, so yeah, extend all of our all of our sovereignty point on economic accumulation and also liberal internationalism because the only response here was that they might actually help these um, Eastern nations, which is literally our whole point. Um, and also like extend our point about settler futurity. This is like a really big magnitude impact because we're saying that we are trying to like stop the settler entity from continuing on continuing on and on in the future, which is which is a high time frame impact and should be outweighed. Okay. Now on to their off. First of all, like we meet, this is a topical, um, this is a topical plan. We have the actor and the resolution. And also this is literally a fact round. It's not, we're not role playing as a USFG. We're just saying we're like debating whether they should or should not like and do something. It literally is not even a policy option. So this doesn't make sense either way. And they also like don't specify what action we stop, which means that like this is probably like we meet this specifically and this shouldn't even be taken into consideration. And either way, um, we still like they didn't ask whether we actually like fiat our plan or not. They ask if there's post fiat and we do fiat our advocacy. Okay, next on to our standards. The first thing is about understanding the state apparatus. This is exactly what we were doing. We we're showing an action that the US could possibly make and how that could play into racial capitalism. We're literally like using activism to use policies to understand the state. This is literally what we are doing. And without without our plan text actually like doing this, we won't be able to like even um, understand the education that they're talking about in their first standard. Their second one is about like practices and how we don't talk about how it would change the world. We feel that advocacy. We're talking about the implementation of an advocacy and the impacts of racial capitalism by using that advocacy. And then their third point is about like predictability. Like literally this is a plan. Even if you don't buy that, predictability is bad. If we knew that everyone was going to run ahead of time, then we would have no portable skills like adaptability. Predictability is a bad norm in general. We literally just are topical. You have to expect any anything within the topical lens because there's only like a few things that we could run under a topical lens you can't predict what our impacts are like if someone ran like an advantage that like you could didn't predict you wouldn't say oh that's unpredictable we can't like debate it because you just debate it the only thing different here differently here is that we have impacts that relate to racial capitalism okay on to the voters um, first, they kind of have like some kind of presumption tr trigger. However, legitimacy only matters when you think fairness matters. And because we clearly see that like because of Adirond discrepancies, which are like actually material change that impacts the ideology, they say that fairness literally does not matter. It's arbitrary and it's based on materialism. And because they agree that materialism comes first, it literally doesn't matter. If fairness doesn't matter, then legitimacy doesn't matter. And that presumption trigger does not stand. Second, they say that like, again, fairness skews evaluation. No, material impacts impact fairness in the first place. It's what is a prior question here, which means that that has to be solved first. And their third point was about like dialogue. They already have an advantage. Af, uh, Af kills uh, petted pedagogical value debate. But de debate has pre-fiat impacts as well. It's not just about post-fiat impacts. Things happen in round, whether you acknowledge them or not, pre-fiat impacts happen. Fairness and, and also like your whole, your only off is like about like our fairness and education, which are pre-fiat impacts. Like, are you just saying that like your voters don't matter because they like literally like double turn themselves here. They say that like, oh, um, pre-fiat impacts don't matter whatsoever, but then they also like run theory. Anyway. Um, and then they like talk about like access and how it like outweighs structural fairness. Like this is definitely probably not the case considering we're topical. And then they talk about idea testing. We do this either way. We probably solve for idea testing better than your shell because we're actually using, uh, we're like looking at an action that the state can take. And also like they talk about like utopian alternatives. We aren't utopian because we're constrained to the changes and impacts that the resolution can do. We are literally just doing the resolution. We can't like um, say that we're solving for all these crazy things because we are constrained to it. Look to the fact that they thought that we could, they said that we, oh, we have to, we should have like impacted out like the the UN or like had the UN do this as well like we're constrained to the resolution which probably means that we don't have utopian alternatives uh and then they say like we don't get to cross apply these arguments like this literally makes no sense especially considering you like don't contest our framework whatsoever 
which means that like you probably like you ignore the fact that like materialism comes first and fairness and education doesn't matter which means that in that world we don't even like that is like the framework level is above um, the theory and critique level which means that we do get to cross apply those just because you like ignore them does not mean that we can um okay now on to the counter interpretation wait is it interpretation in the chat okay um the affirmation may defend the 1ac in the implementation of a post or pre fiat implications if they have a topical plan text using the actor in the resolution okay um now on to sorry let me pull this up Okay, now on to the counter -sterns. One is K literature. There's literally no other activity that allows you to learn about structures literature like debate does. K lit is best engaged on AF with a plan because then we have more time to actually talk about the K and learn about it more. And it's actually more applicable because we were looking at a policy um, and policy option or like seeing something that the state can do, which is in our world. And Caleb is more important because otherwise we will remain philosophically unaware about the abusive oppressive structures around us. Without it, we would have no checkbacks on systems of power. Two is clash. You are better able to engage with lit if you introduce it in the first speech and you have more time to respond. Um, three, marginalized communities can overcome the injustices they face at a round that may become disadvantageous within debate and allow them to win rounds and also spread activism. Um, four is uh, five. Four is reciprocity. Reciprocity is much more normalized for neg to run case. It's only fair that we get rid of the stigma around AF case and let both sides run what they want. Okay, now on to Pascal's. Okay, one. There's no verifiability of this power. You're probably lost with this argument before, and we're all still happy. How do you know if, if unplugging the matrix? In fact, we argue that if we do live in a matrix, which um, Nueva BZ has infinite power, the unplugging of the matrix would be net good. Right. Unplugging the matrix means you're removing the control that the matrix has over us. The matrix. Uh, the matrix controls our desire flows by telling us to fear it, and so removing it solves for winning the run it's not the same as willing every ballot this means that every, even if you yeah oh sorry yeah um because of this we like have no proof of like whether the matrix um exists and we should probably plug it out either way so for those reasons you should be voting af Neha, were you at the counter enter because i wanted to send it to the chat but i didn't yeah yeah it. let me type it um i think i'm going to give the speech with my video off just because it's been stuttering a little uh order is going to be Let's see, I'll do, um, so there's gonna be some stuff that you're gonna wanna flow in a new sheet. And I'll put that first. Um, and then I'll do the critique in order and then I'll do Pascal's book, uh, which, which is the stuff that they call the matrix, uh, that sheet. All right. Oh my God, I can't, sorry, getting my timer right now. All right, eight minutes, my time will start now. Okay, so on a new sheet, just like blow this stuff. In the status quo, we see that Iran is supporting terrorism. We see that Iran supplies political support and, and weapons to Hamas, which is an organization like classified as a terrorist organization. They're probably backing terrorists in a proxy war against Israel. Uh, we also see like, uh, we also see Iran backed Shia mis mil uh, militia groups uh, participated in an attack on a US embassy. We see like, uh, is there anything? Uh, is there okay, secondarily, uh, secondarily, uh, still on the sheet. Uh, we see that Myanmar is also really bad. We see that in status quo in Myanmar, we see that there's been a recent coup and the government is cracking down on protesters. Specifically, they really don't like the resistance of the protesters. According to the diplomat, at least 82 people were killed on Saturday in Myanmar during a crackdown on anti coup protesters. We also see that Myanmar's military junta were using minimal force. Um, okay, so that's essentially going to be on its own sheet. Uh, and then we'll move on to the critique. Okay. On to critique. First of all, extend materialism is fire die for the more material team because they tell you that there's no solvency outside of materialism. Which is that, like, if a team doesn't read material impact, that means that like they can't solve for any of the uh, any of the like ideological things that they want to solve for. Uh, just like extend that uh, materialism is a prerequisite to solving for literally anything in today's round. Uh, so like, yeah, don't let them kick out of that. They tell you that they have the entirety of, a, of an advantage structure just without the uniqueness. We tell you that uniqueness specifically defines the material harm that they have to be solving for. Impacts without uniqueness is just thinking with no application to the real world. Because uniqueness is what actually ties it to the real world. Which means that at the level where they don't read to you any uniqueness, they're not solving for any material harm. They aren't even claiming to solve for any material harm because they haven't identified what material harm they're possibly trying to solve for. That's exactly what uniqueness tries to do. It identifies what is bad in the status quo that they have to go solve for. So like essentially, just saying that they have uh, that they an advantage structure without the uniqueness, the uniqueness is the most critical part for them to claim that they're being material, uh, materialist. Because like without the uniqueness, they 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 don't know what impact they're solving for. There's like solving in the abstract for this idea of racial capitalism that has no material tying to the real world. Okay. 
uh, yeah, so this means that, uh, this means that, yeah, since they don't read uniqueness and we read uniqueness, uh, you should vote for us, uh, which is what the earlier sheet was. Uh, oh, I guess I can make some claim that I saw. Should I make some claim that I saw for this, Spencer? I don't know, you're fine. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll just, no. uh, I'll just keep on going. Okay, on the, uh, on the advocacy sheet, uh, okay, we tell, okay, they tell you that they have to be constrained to the resolution, but we tell you this is a terminal, terminal uniqueness overwhelms the link defense here, because we tell you that, first of all, they don't stop all sanctions, there's still economic sanctions on, like, Iran, uh, or, like, other countries like Myanmar, and uh, we tell you that specifically financial sanctions are uh, at the level where they don't give you a reason why financial sanctions are more crippling towards economies than economic sanctions, but we give you reasons why financial sanctions are more uh, effective at solving for human rights violations than, than economic sanctions. You should be voting just to preserve financial sanctions because economic sanctions would be just as bad uh, for like the people in these countries. Uh, at least that's what's that's what's in this debate. We tell you that financial sanctions specifically, uh, which is what this resolution is talking about, solve for apartheid, and that this paper says that they're uniquely affected by getting uh, at, like, yeah, at, at, at like uh, solving for humanitarian crises, like the impacts that we read to you in our, or sorry, like the uniqueness like that we, yeah, they tell you, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, also, like, extend, like, it doesn't matter if they're constrained to the resolution. This is still non unique because, like, if, uh, first of all, the United States can still impose economic sanctions, and also, like, other countries can still impose sanctions and still will. So it doesn't matter if they're constrained to the resolution, it's still non-unique. Um, yeah, which means that they don't have solvency for the, like, actual material harm that they have here. Okay. Uh, I have no clue how I'm going to spend four minutes on Pascal's money, but I'm going to try. Okay. They tell you that Pascal's monkey isn't verifiable. This does not matter. Verifiability is a probability indict of any argument, right? It doesn't terminally... It's not, it's not terminal defense at the level where there's like a 0.00000x percent chance of us actually of us actually uh, having the ability to do this. Uh, which means that even if it's not verifiably true, which we claim to you is actually true. So just to reiterate what the argument is, we hold the power to create infinite happiness. Specifically, we're going to uh, specifically claim that after this round is over, if you have voted for us, uh, we're going to continue creating happy people. We're going to create infinitely many happy people. We're going to make everyone here happy, and we're going to extend the lifespan of the universe um, like to infinity, which means that we physically create infinite happiness, which over, which outweighs any small probability that this is actually true, because that's because there's clearly a uh, non-infinitely small probability that this is actually true. Um, so at the level really, don't give you any framework arguments as to, or any like weighing level arguments as to why you should be uh, why you shouldn't be like weighing this. Uh, you should buy that like this is going to outweigh the entirety of case or sorry the entirety of the critique and case uh we don't read we don't even need to read to you that this is pre fiat so this isn't actually a violation of the theory shell uh because uh because even if this is a... sure go ahead um if i told you go that ahead. me and kathy would be very very sad like if you like did that to us would you not do it in that case like um, what if we were like, not, no. we're really because sad. we would argue that infinite happiness listen to what that we, way. we would be happy about. So, like, everyone except for us would be happy. Yeah, we would argue that infinite happiness. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which means that this doesn't, yeah. So, essentially, you vote for us on any probability that we can actually do this because it's a literally infinite impact. It's not like extinction because extinction is a finite impact because there's heat death in the universe. This is the only literally infinite impact that you'll probably ever see uh, because we extend the heat death of the universe. To make this argument about the matrix, um, we never said anything about the matrix. I'm not sure where they got the matrix from. There's no matrix anywhere here. Uh, like, not sure where they thought that we were referencing the matrix, but we didn't reference the matrix. Um, okay, uh, on to, yeah, on to the, in, okay. So on to the interaction of this with frameworks. First of all, we would argue that this up layers framework, because again, a literally infinite, uh, We'd argue that this probably uplayers framework because like it's literally infinite, which means that it doesn't matter what the discount rate for uh what the discount rate framework entails uh for impacts that aren't under that framework is, it's still literally infinite. But secondarily, we'd argue that the world that we create is actually exactly what the uh what the framework actually implies is a good thing. Because we tell you, first of all, this is like an extremely material impact. We tell you that we're creating infinite happiness. This is extremely materialist. Uh, secondarily, we tell you that the world that we create is probably socialist, so we probably satisfy their uh, their role of the ballot. We tell you that uh, we're 
creating a distribution of happiness from a central entity, which is like us to everyone else. Uh, so this creates, first of all, pure equality, or sorry, pure equity, because everyone is equally happy. And secondarily, it creates, uh, it, like, decon it perfectly deconstructs racism and capitalism, because everyone is literally perfectly equal, because they're all infinitely happy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this definitely weighs under the materialism. This definitely satisfies the role of the ballot, which means that we're winning. It's, we don't even need to win that this is, uh, oh yeah, this is where I stopped. We don't even need to win that this is post fiat because if it's pre-fiat, we still outweigh them on case. Uh, or sorry, we don't even need to win that. Sorry, this is pre-fiat because if it's post fiat, we still outweigh them on case. Um, but it is pre-fiat because uh, like we're in the real world right now. Uh, epistemic modesty, which is that you should be defaulting to the evaluation of probability times magnitude because they didn't give you an alternative to it. <sighs> All right, uh, four minutes. Order is probably a new sheet. I'm just gonna be going through like voting issues. Um, so yeah, probably makes most sense to float on a new sheet. All right, anyone not ready? Great, starting time now. So there are three key reasons that we're winning this debate, like three layers. So the first layer is the issue of infinite happiness, like they call this, like the Pascal's mugging, whatever you want to call it. Like basically, we tell you in very simple terms that we can create like infinite, that I can create infinite utility. It is truly infinite because I can stop the heat death of the universe. Um, and so like we should, we say you should be valuing all inputs of epistemic modesty, which is basically the probability times magnitude. They haven't given you an alternative like epistemic modesty as just how you like the stable way to like evaluate, evaluate impact and to weigh like both how likely something is to happen and how bad something is to happen. So even if it's low probability, like because it's infinite impact, we say like the probability times magnitude on epistemic modesty is going to outweigh anything else. And you should always be preferring voting for us. Um, even like any despite any probability in dice they give including verifiability because verifiability is just a probability in type uh next of all this wins on the roll the ballot because these people that i will create if we win this round are in an uncolonized world free of racial capitalism and since i'm distributing that happiness to everyone i'm like a central entity i say that's pretty damn socialist to me meaning like we are actually eradicating like we're like we are creating an anti-colonial socialist method of eradicating racial capitalism that should be voting for us on the roll of the ballot Again, just for some more weighing, this is outweigh anything else. Um, like they, the POI makes it like sound like they say that this is going to make them sad. A, that's a new argument. They should have made that in the MG. But B, only we have the power to stop the heat death of the universe, meaning even if they're sad for a finite period of time, we're creating infinite happiness for an infinite period of time. You should always be preferring that. And if they say it can stop the heat death of the universe, A, that would be a new argument. And B, the fact that we read it first probably means that we have a higher probability. So at the point where it's the same magnitude, but like a higher probability because like we're more likely to read it first. So like we actually have that power. You should just be preferring us on epistemic modesty. Um, yeah, and if they say that like this creates colonialism because it's happiness for some people at the expense of others, like the impact of infinite people not being subject to any sort of colonialism is still going to outweigh that. And like we say again, we're going to give it to literally everyone. And so like we're and we're going to give it to literally everyone, so it doesn't even like it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so you can vote for us on this point. Um, again, like vote for us to create infinite happiness for it, like literal eternity. Um, moving on to the second. Um, yeah, mo yeah, moving on to the uh, second issue, which is that of the role of the ballot. Um, oh yeah, or, 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 or the second issue, which is that of presumption. Uh, so we can see that essentially, like, if we look at the role of the ballot specifically, vote for the team with the best method of eradicating racial capitalism. But as both Timothy and I tell you, the affirmative advocacy, like, even if, like, you grant them 100% of what they're trying to do, is not going to eradicate racial capitalism in any form at the point where there are still so other forms of sanctions that don't require specifically on the dollar, when there are other countries doing sanctions, when there are other ways that the U.S., like, exhibits its hegemonic power, when there are other ways that capitalism perpetuates. They're, like, they have literal no solvency for, like, you know, like, with the best social method, like, for the role of the ballot, for eradicating racial capitalism, uh, like, it, and so like you should just be like presuming negative because the affirmative is not like fulfill the burden of like proving the resolution being true. Um, so you can just like presume negative because they literally have no solvency again because they're not like the role of ballot is not like reducing racial capitalism is specifically about eradicating. They have to prove to you that they will be able to eradicate racial capitalism in order to win this round and they do not do that. 
Um, yeah, next extend like all their framing about why materialism comes first, why material impacts are really important. Again, extend all the material impacts that Timothy reads to you. Um, like re reach you in our speech, uh, like these, this, this, the uniqueness from the disadvantages that we crafted that we weren't able to run. So A, like we're better on the material testing, we could be specifically create understanding of material impacts that we could then like possibly act to like work to solve in the future. But it's also an indict to the app, not actually focusing on material impacts, and instead like having this utopian space where they say they're going to eradicate racial capitalism, even though they do literally nothing. And that's probably just another reason to be rejecting them. So for these reasons, uh, vote neg. Cool. Uh, I'm going to be starting on Pascal's Gambit, then I'll move on to materialism theory and then just general weighing. Cool. I start my time now. Jumping into Pascal's Gambit, Neha gives you a three pronged response for why this is inconsequential in the round. Neha explains to you that since you guys have had infinite power and you, that you have decided to wield negatively by keeping us all unhappy, then refusing to engage in voting for them or is the only, or voting for the app is the only way to remove the stranglehold they have on universal happiness. If you guys have been in charge of happiness the whole time, then you've essentially caused racial capitalism, which means that you still vote off in order to upset despotic leaders that have caused all of the world's issues and for the, for, to allow the world to gain true happiness through equality attainment. So again, look at the fact that Neha tells you that winning the round also that, that essentially like we don't know first of all if we're going to be happy and like i'll get to the response to that later and we also tell you that because you guys have infinite power unplugging or like it, getting out of this mate or they said it's not a matrix but like how else would you wield this power like leaving the matrix or upsetting the leaders of the matrix that have essentially caused infinite suffering in the world is the like best net good thing they don't respond to this at all they just tell you that like verify verifiability is a probability and like sure but still even at the point at which we've told you that you guys are the root cause of racial capitalism we're still winning this debate because the impact of like stopping the infinite unhappiness you like caused for the world is a bigger impact also latour poi the fact that they guarantee that not ever that they can't guarantee that everyone will be happy because they don't care that we will be sad shows this is structurally bad who Out of gets order, to actually i don't think you guys said that colonialism is an infinite impact oh yeah uh, it was extending settler futurity i did say that yeah i think y'all said that it's very that it outweighs on time frame i don't think y'all said that it's infinite we said that as well, but we said, that, like, if you continue to allow for settler futurity to exist, then that is an infinite impact because it's continued existing. Okay. Okay. You said it, you said it. Yep. okay. Yeah, resuming time now. The fact that they can't guarantee that everyone will be happy because they don't care that we will be sad shows that this is structurally bad because who gets to be happy? If it's infinite, then it definitely will not be the environment, definitely not Kathy and I, or Neha and I, because we told you that we wouldn't be happy. So that, like this proves that verifiability is like a key issue in this round because there's no way to guarantee that they're going to make everyone happy. And there's no way to guarantee that they won't just reproduce the same like settler colonialist methods of like like delegating happiness to like privileged individuals. Also, like how is this on a matrix? How else would you do this? You say that you're gonna make everyone live forever. That's bad for the environment, but whatever, we're not collapsing into that. Now on the F, on the framework. The thesis here is they fundamentally misunderstood the role of this entire like critical advantage. Again, extend the fact they have no counter roll the ballot like of who is the best method of, method of eradicating racial capitalism. They tell you because we like don't eradicate racial capitalism because it's just a single type of sanction. Like Nahos had a response to this out of the MG. We tell you that the US is the most prominent settler colonialist actor and by removing the mechanisms by which they exert power over other countries is absolutely solvent because we're like norm setting one and we have the possibility to spill over. So like that's not how case works. You don't have to have like 100% probability of your impacts happening in order to like gain access to them. That's not how this works. We give you a mechanism that goes like unrefuted for the entire block for how the U.S. does spill over to like eradicating racial capitalism, like uh, like throughout everything. Then they tell you that we don't have materialism because we don't have uniqueness. We literally do have this. We explained to you why racial capitalism is bad. Our thesis was essentially uniqueness. We just don't tag it out as uniqueness. We were telling you about racial capitalism in the status quo, and they also had responses to all of these like arguments. Like again, out of the MG. So clearly, we are the more material team because we explained to you the material impacts of like what this would have on these individuals, whereas you guys have like operated exclusively in this round, while also somehow claimed that you guys were the more material team. Like you're telling us that in this round are gonna give us infinite happiness and also that like fairness and education are like important things when Neha's responded to these, again, straight out of the block. Then they tell you that like uh, extend like essentially all of this like advantage. We have all of these impacts for why like you have to remove these sanctions that the US is exerting on other countries too. And ecocide and commodification people of color, which are huge impacts, the negative is literally responsible for by like choosing not to make everyone happy in this well now moving on to uh the shell 
extend the we meet this is a topical plan with post fiat policy options so like they literally don't have like a response to this at all they just tell you that because we don't have uniqueness when we clearly do like just extend the we meet this is terminal defense we're winning the shell extend all the counter standards they don't respond to any of these extend the fact they tell you about competing interests but then don't respond to our cat like we we won the shell cleanly now on to just general weighing uh voters first of all they don't properly respond to materialism first happiness isn't material meaning that if we are the only ones with structural impacts in the round even if we have a small impact of decreasing racial capitalism it doesn't matter because we're the only ones of, of increasing racial capital it doesn't matter because we're the only ones with actual material change they tell you that they prepped the disads uh we we prepped this uh, yeah, we prepped dissents that were materialist is their only response. The fact that they didn't even run them, even though we were topical, proves they have no materialist solvency. So ultimately, we have cleanly won this round on the like uh, advantage alone. Then they tell you, settler futurity is infinite unless we stop it through the plan. Racial capitalism is essentially the internal link to their entire like Pascal situation. Making everyone equally happy removes the struggles that makes them who they are, which leads to cultural erasure, meaning that racial capitalism will always be present because people can't be conscious of their choices. Additionally, we get to answer this because they only made Pascal an alternate solvency under our framework in the block. Additionally, they tell you in the block that they end racial capitalism. Capitalism. This means they directly link into settler futurity. This is settler futurity because it's allowed for the continued existence of the neg, which is essentially the settler body by allowing for all of the suppression to exist in the school. So they tell you that like they're going to engage its active hand washing, right? Like, okay, we've allowed for all of this to happen for like all of humanity, but we're going to end racial capitalism if you vote for us right now. This is a direct link into the settler futurity that we talk about, where like essentially through this active hand washing, you allow for the continued existence of the negative who has oppressed all of these people. So for because of the reason that like number one, you are upsetting the despotic leaders that have caused all pain and suffering in the world like and thereby like allowing us a mechanism to gain true happiness with, with uncooperative desire flows we are clearly winning this debate thank you for the bit everyone you know the drill i uh, pause the recording as well is everyone here Okay, right, does anyone want to announce the decision or should I or? You can go for it. Okay, okay. it was a 3-0 for the affirmative. Um, and I can go first with my RFD then I guess. Um, so I started the top with theory. I think theory gets resolved clearly through the we meet because um, the negative is not extending the violation or any of the nitty gritty on the standards throughout the debate. So I think the theory does get resolved cleanly as is said in the PMR. Then I go to the role of the ballot, material impacts, racial capitalism, whatnot, um, and who solves best solves racial capitalism. On the affirmative, I see that, ooh, can I read my own handwriting? Oh yeah, the affirmative claims to reduce uh, racial capitalism or reduce or resolve racial capitalism through a fiat plan text. Not really sure what that actually looks like. I got very confused through this whole like, don't defend post fiat impacts, do defend pre fiat impacts. Oh, but we're writing a plan. It's a fiat plan, but I, I, I don't. I got kind of lost on those arguments. I don't think it was read in a way that's neat or really ex explains to me what your solvency is. But I think your actual solvency arguments do are largely conceded by the negative. I also think that these, the negative, large mostly has this index of your material impacts that is coming from the theory level of the debate, but they're not extending any of the theory standards or this theory underview that actually gives them that power to continue making these arguments that you don't have material impacts. The only arguments that go extended from the negative are these arguments about uniqueness. I think you do read uniqueness. You say you read uniqueness and you extend your uniqueness. This argument on financial sanctions um, and human rights violations, I think that's more of a, like they create material impacts because they have uniqueness. I'm really confused because you don't collapse to any actual impact on this argument um, as to how you solve human rights violations. I also think that even though this isn't really read, but this isn't read by the affirmative, this is just like my offhand opinion, but I, I think that your arguments on Iran funding terrorism and getting into proxy wars with Israel um, is also is pretty similar colonialist um, to say, but it doesn't really matter in the end. This argument just confuses me. Um, then you're reading this argument that they're not unique. I think that's mitigative defense at best. Um, so I'm not really sure um, what these material impacts actually look like from the affirmative. I'm not 100% sure what their advocacy is, um, but I do think the probability, probability wise, the affirmative is probably causing some material impacts. You're not reading any offense on the um, on F case. So I would err that the affirmative is making 
um, probability there. Then I go to Pascal. Uh, no, the, the affirmative is making material impacts there. Then I go to Pascal's mugging. Uh, again, I cannot read my own handwriting. Oh yeah, okay. So then you're saying that you're you're ending racial capitalism by creating infinite happiness. First of all, I think this argument is really, really weird to make. Um, I think originally it's fine. I mean, like it's not my favorite thing in the world, but in the MO and the, L uh, and the LOR, it does become really, really weird. I think it's kind of like disrespectful to say like, oh, because you're creating infinite happiness, that means you're gonna create a socialist state that ends settler colonialism and racial capitalism as if like, settled colonialism is inherently a product of capitalism and a socialist state can't be settler colonialist and racial capitalist not really read by the affirmative but i'm just i was just kind of like weirded out by the way this argument was read in the mo i also think there's a lot of contradictions in the way that you're reading these arguments because like you are reading arguments that like iran is funding terrorists is is is, a, is funding terrorism and that sanctions in the united states are a good thing to eradicate human rights violations. And then you're also reading that you're going to be creating a socialist state free of racial capitalism. I'm confused on this. I also think your probability arguments don't really make sense because I think that if you're reading an argument, it has one warrant and an impact, and then there's no responses to it, that argument will have 100% probability. But I think if you're reading an argument and there's no warrants and, and an impact to it, it has 0% probability. So, so to just say that like, because just because like, I, I don't know what your warrant is for your argument that you're gonna be able to create a state that is free of settled colonialism and racial capitalism that you have to have the capacity to end it. Like, there's no warrants for this besides you saying it. And at that point, it's just the claim. Um, so having one warrant at least would be nice. Um, then you could read your verifiability arguments because then there is actually a probability that this exists because the probability doesn't, the probability of something occurring doesn't change with it after you say it, right? Like, so theoretically right now, there's a 0% probability that I have the power to change it. Me saying that I do have the power to create infinite happiness doesn't doesn't increase the probability of that happening. Me giving you a warrant that I can, I, that I can, create infinite happiness that does change the probability okay um then i think these affirmative arguments about like cultural erasure reproducing settler capitalism settled future future you, you know what i mean um being infinite the specific in the neg is a settler bo body those arguments are all uh, warranted and reasonable i think after the way the negative has constructed this argument and that's how i can vote affirmative Gabe, do you mind if I go next? Go for it. Thank you, Gabe. Um, so while I do agree with much of the sentiment that Aisha provided specifically, um, my thoughts are a little less coherent on the matter. So I will read my RFD uh, and then just sort of get into the feedback stuff later after Gabe maybe. Um, I vote affirmative in this debate to endorse that the USFG should not use its power over the dollar payment system to sanction other countries as the best available anti-colonial socialist method of eradicating racial capitalism. At the um, And let me just start with the arguments that get out of the way quickly. At the framing level, I default to the conceded role of the ballot. On theory, there's extended terminal defense, whether it's the arguments that the negative doesn't collapse to or the we meet that the Aff extends and the counter interpretation even. So I don't cast my ballot here. On case, there's a sufficient, albeit implicit, uniqueness provided in the PMC to describe the nature of the US as the world's largest economic hegemon and that the methodology of the affirmative retains a propensity to resolve this. So now, also, so altogether, this means that this round comes down to the layering slash weighing of the Aff method versus the paradox within the context of fulfilling this, uh, the role of the ballot as established. I have a really hard time evaluating this paradox on face because I have a lot of the similar outstanding uh, uh, objections to it that Isha voiced, but uh, I really had to sort of check that initial response. So I did my best to just evaluate this based on the arguments in the flow and I will update my paradigm accordingly. Um, so I just wanted to say that to, to specifically Nueva in this case. Um, but this paradox is naked out of the LOC and is only heavily backfilled throughout the block. So I grant that the PMR will be able to make golden turns on this argument, which is where I end up casting my ballot in this debate. 
Ultimately, I conclude that while verifiability itself is a non-starter due to the infinite scope of the impacts of the paradox, there is a terminal risk of re that the paradox will only reproduce racial capitalism via the articulations. Um, the theme of the articulations established uh, in the as early as the MG, but um, expanded on uh, after the block, specifically that the negative has acted as a gatekeeper of happiness this entire time, which is bad, but also that the creation of infinite happiness erases the difference that caused the uh, which is a precondition for racial capitalism. Additionally, on the point of order, I do grant that such satellite future, uh, futurity is a eternal impact absent the advocacy. So there's like further way in here and we're operating on a comparable level, um, but that's ultimately where I cast my ballot. I, um, I will just say again, that I have a really hard time sort of imagining that all of racial capitalism could be resolved because Two high schoolers told me that if I voted for them, I would it would, as it is explained to me. So the performative implications of this argument are uh, highly troubling to me. But again, I did do my best to try and check that and cast my ballot based on the offense of the flow. And I will update my paradigm accordingly. That's all for me. Okay, um, I don't really disagree uh, with either of the decisions of the other two judges, but I still, I'll still read my RFD because I think there may be, you know, there might be some insights in there. So I vote AF. Both teams agree to the affirmative materialism framework in the round. So there are only a few questions I need to resolve. One uh, is happiness material. Uh, I have that it is from the NAG and that it isn't from the AF with no warrants or comparison from either side. So I'm unfortunately left to, to my own understanding of materialism to resolve this. I think it is probably not material because it seems theoretically possible to be like happy, but also like have bad material conditions, like you're enslaved or something. Uh, so material conditions are not analogous to material conditions. Uh, I guess you could probably also make a successful argument that it is material because of like brain chemistry or something. Um, but ultimately, I think that like the way that I understand materialism, this is the least interventiony way to uh, resolve this question when there is no when there's just parallel claims being made. On this alone, I find that risk of offense from the affirmative plan is enough to win my ballot, as there's no no other impacts because all you're doing is increasing um, happiness. I buy that the AF has at least a chance to solve racial capitalism via these spillover arguments that are made and there is and that there is clear harms being perpetuated. I think the negative's uniqueness overwhelms the clink, uh, link argument. While said to be terminal in the block is not actually terminal when you don't answer the MG spillover claims. Uh, this defensive claim that there are other sanctions is pretty good defense, but absent any other offense and or 100% uh, terminalized defensive claim, I default AF on the risk that we solve racial capitalism and resolve the impact of settler futurity, which is the biggest impact in the round. On this uniqueness question, I think that the AF correctly identifies that they do read uniqueness. Uh, they just don't call it such. Uh, I think racial capitalism exists in the status quo is a sufficient explanation for me in the PMR, uh, but like, you know, it's throughout. Uh, also like this Iran example about not being able to get vaccines in this quote is also a uniqueness claim, but I digress. On the Pascal something or other argument, I have many thoughts about this. First of all, the central thesis as it is read and extended by the negative does not constitute an argument for me paradigmatically. I believe that an argument consists of both a claim and a warrant. If you make claims without providing evidence which explains why that claim is true, I will not vote for that argument. The claim that you can create infinite happiness is unwarranted in the entire debate. So even if this whole sheet was called conceded, I honestly probably wouldn't vote for it. What I mean here is that you need some sort of mechanism to like say that you how you ensure happiness. If you just like had said we live in the matrix and I'm Neo and I was conceded that I guess would be sufficient even though it'd be a stupid warrant. Um, absent all the stuff however, uh, I am also persuaded by the arguments uh, that you are a settler, a settler body because you could solve racial capitalism, but you choose not to. Um, the shell in the LOC, as Joel points out, is very short and underexplained, so I do grant the PMR a lot of leverage on these new articulations. Just some thoughts for the negative. I think, like, if you really, because, you know, sometimes teams are like, oh, we had, like, 15 disads that we lost because they were untopical. If you really did have two disads that you uh, could have read, I think the a better negative strategy would be to just read them because they clearly defend a particular plan in action. I think that would have given you a lot uh, more game in the round. I just want to add, I really think that you should retire this argument because it's been read in front of me before on a panel before. And I think on that panel, all the judges kind of just expressed their displeasure with the argument at that time. And even though it's been changed, I, I remember like before it was about killing everyone in the matrix and now it's not about that anymore. Even though it's been changed, like it obviously has like some problematic 
repercussions to it. And I think it would just be a better idea not to read this argument because both of you are very talented debaters that have capacity to win rounds without reading that argument. So I think that you should consider not reading it in the future. Yeah, to echo that sentiment, I do think that you have a lot of game in a more uh, even traditional debate where you don't try and uplayer the K with an you know, with a larger magnitude impact, right? Sometimes I feel like debaters can miss the forest for the trees, but the AF is defending a pretty clear action that you would be able to generate a good amount of offense against. Obviously, it's tricky uh, versus this particular Campo team because they have a tendency to read a couple different arguments and it's difficult to anticipate that, but um, the risk of getting paneled twice with this type of argument uh, would probably outweigh that in my mind at this point. All right, thanks. Cool, thanks. Hey, great, congratulations to both teams and good luck in future ELMS Campo. Bye. Yeah. All right, bye. bye.